Hello, everyone, and welcome to this special Blue Coat Talk with artist Ruth Cuthand. This talk is brought to you as part of the second annual Kenora Science Festival in partnership with the Muse Kenora. My name is Grace, and I'm pleased to be coming to you today from Kenora. We'd like to acknowledge that the Kenora Science Festival is taking place in Treaty 3 territory and give thanks to the Anishinaabeg who've been stewards of this land since time immemorial. We pay respect to their traditions, ways of knowing, and acknowledge their may, many contributions to science, technology, engineering, and math, past and present. We also recognize the Métis Nation of Ontario for their historic and ongoing contributions in this region. Joining us today is artist Ruth Cuthand, whose exhibition, Beads of Truth, is on display at the Muse from September 17th to November 27th. Ruth is of Plains Cree and Scottish ancestry. She's a member of Little Pine First Nation, but spent most of her childhood in Cardston, Alberta, near the Blood Reserve. For more than 40 years, she's used her art as a platform to present historic and contemporary Indigenous settler experiences, with an em emphasis on Indigenous health. Welcome, Ruth. Hi. Hi, <laughs> Ruth. So good to have you. So before we jump into our conversation, I do want to remind our viewers that if they've got a question for you and would like to ask you a question, they can type it in the comments or the chat sec section below the video. I'm sorry, I can't, I can't hear you. Oh, make sure, okay, let's get your audio. I still can't hear you, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right here, we're just gonna do a little bit of tech troubleshooting here, make sure we get some sound. All right, I'm going to pull you off the screen for a moment, Ruth, and see if we put you back in, if we can get some audio. All right, can you hear me now? No, we were just talking. <clears throat> How about now, Ruth, are you able to hear me? How are we Dang. doing? <clears throat> are you able to hear me now, Ruth? Oh, all right, we're having some technical difficulties, your camera is off. I can still see you.
All right, I think we may have short technical issues now. Ruth, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Perfect. I can hear okay. you. So that's lovely. Ah. Sorry about that, everyone. But now we're back and we'll jump right into our conversation with Ruth. Okay. So if any of our viewers have questions as we go, they can type it in the comments section of the video and we'll be able to answer those as well. So the Beads of Truth exhibition at the Muse, it contains works from several of your series. And we are gonna have a look at each of those series and some of the pieces from them in a moment, but maybe to start off, can you tell us a little bit about your art overall? Uh, well, I've been making art for over 40 years <clears throat> and um, I'm, um, I'm not one of those artists that takes one practice and becomes a master at it. I like to use um, different painting, photography, um, beading um, as ways to get across um, what I want to talk about. And lately it's been beads and beading um, diseases and talking about uh, Indigenous health. Awesome. So you said right now beadwork is it's what's been kind of your medium of choice uh, and that's what's used in the pieces that are in the exhibition here at the Muse. Um, so is there a particular reason you chose beadwork for these messages or you know what brought you to beadwork for this? Well I, I was teaching a beadwork class for uh, First Nations University of Canada and because um, I taught art classes on the Saskatoon campus <clears throat> And they had to take a beading class. And I was trying to think of a way that they could do beading that would engage them throughout the whole process. So I, I um, thought of samplers. You know how little girls used to learn how to do embroidery and handwork, and they did these different kind of stitches. And so I thought, OK, so if they did like these different, learn these different kinds of stitches, uh then i have to think of a subject and so <clears throat> what i decided was is that they would be paintings because then you have to be engaged with the colors going to be different and then you have to put these different stitches into these areas and and it worked really well it worked really really well <clears throat> uh so then i was kind of trying to figure out what I wanted to do for my own practice. And I did things like I beaded um, color blindness tests with the little round blobs of colored beads and the number in the middle. And I, um, what else did I do? <clears throat> and I tried some text work, but I just, I just wasn't satisfied with it. And one day I got um, beads from the States uh, cause I ordered from a particular um, place in the United States and they came and I was laying they were on Hank so they're strung uh, laying them out and the sun was shining on them and I thought oh boy these are beautiful beautiful things there's the colors so deep they're so shiny and I thought you know when indigenous women first saw these they uh, they must have just been as enthralled as I was with beads and and so I started thinking about trade, about, you know, um, the iron pot, which, you know, gave us more food safety, the knife, which allowed us to, you know, skin and butcher and <clears throat> all those kinds of things. And then I started thinking about the downside of trade, which was, you know, guns and um, uh, disease. And so then I, I um, did some research and looked up to find out because everybody talks about diseases coming to the Americas, <clears throat> but nobody actually says what they were. So I did, I did research and I found a paper where they talked about these 11 diseases that came from the old world to the new world. And then I started looking them up um, through Google images and just looking at the virus. And so these images of, uh, of uh, microscopic views uh, viruses came up and they've been colored by a medical illustrator mm -hmm. and so they were ah oh, just gorgeous and I thought wow these things can translate into beads so well and I'm kind of um, an abstract artist I don't try to do things realistically and I thought man they're so abstract 
And so then I thought, okay, what I want to do with these images is I want it to look like you're peering through a microscope. So I want them to be round and I want the image and then the background just to be black. And so I started beating these and oh my goodness, they, they were so beautiful. Yeah. And I, I was beating them and I was going like, hey, I don't do beautiful art. What am I doing? These are going to be so gorgeous, you know? And, and um, then I realized that, yeah, they're gorgeous, but they're diseases that actually killed people. And so that is what's going to like cut the, the beauty of them. People are going to go, oh, those are so beautiful. And then they're going to go, oh, my God. And um, so the first series I did was called Surviving and where I looked at the images, the diseases. And it was really interesting because a lot of them are like childhood diseases that uh, – you know, are very common, like chicken pox, measles, whooping cough. And, um, but indigenous people had never encountered these diseases before. And so that, you know, it just uh, overwhelmed them and they died from them. Yeah. Yeah. That maybe brings us quite nicely to maybe showing some of the images, the first uh, images you mentioned that the first the piece you did was the, the trading and surviving pieces. So uh, I'm gonna toss a few images up on the screen and you can maybe tell us about what some of the pieces specifically from the, the series look like. Okay. So we'll add that here, all right. So this is the first one. Syphilis is interesting because it's the I, I was trying to look for an image that uh, for a disease that went back to the old country. And so in my research, I found out that syphilis was one of them. Um, and syphilis is really interesting because it was a very simple skin disease. This is a, uh, this is theory. Uh, so so it was a simple skin disease, but when the Spaniards came to Central America, uh, because they wore clothing, uh, the disease couldn't pass as easily as it had before. So it mutated, as we all know about mutations today. It actually mutated into a sexually transmitted plus skin disease. Because if you uh, were unfortunate to kiss somebody who had a syphilis sore on their face, you would get syphilis. Um, and so it was both uh, skin contact and sexually transmitted. And so I um, wanted to do it in a material that was not um, uh, contact material like beads were. So I, I actually learned how to do quill work and I cleaned, dyed, sorted, and uh, learned two stitches for syphilis, which you can't see too well here. But yeah, that's the only one that is uh, done with quill work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very good point you make in terms of what you can or can't see on the screen. Yeah. These images are beautiful, but I would highly recommend that anybody seeing these images and, and seeing how beautiful they are here, come and check them out in person. Yeah. Uh, I checked out the exhibit this morning and it, huge difference photo versus in person. They're yeah. really stunning. Ah, oh, yellow fever. Yes. Yellow fever is found like um, in uh, Central South America and a little bit into um, the southern United States. And so this is like a, an image of it's like stained. So you can see the blue stain around the uh, individual virus. Ah, influenza. I love this one because I love talking to children about it. This is actually a view of the influenza virus. Um, it, it, uh, it's airborne and it goes into your nose and it goes into your mucus um, uh, cells. And then once it's in the mucus cell, it uses that uh, energy to replicate. And so as the, as the, they replicate, the mucus gets stretched out and, in uh, ways so when you are sick and you get that stringy snot that, that's all the influenza virus replicating uh in your mucus and so that's why when you blow your nose uh you shouldn't just throw your kleenex around the room you should actually put it in a bag and you should be responsible for putting it in the garbage and not your mom <laughs> 
Yeah, I think that's something we're all sort of um, extra familiar with right now, of course, with the um, current, you know, the pandemic and with COVID, we, we're all extra aware of washing our hands, uh, you know, putting our tissues and things in the garbage, all the sort of the things we need to do to make sure that we're not spreading diseases. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Diphtheria. Diphtheria. Uh, I, I have never quite understood diphtheria, but it's, uh, it's another um, respiratory disease, isn't it? I'm not as familiar with the details on, on diphtheria. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> it's not, a, it's not around very much anymore. I don't think. We don't definitely don't see it in Canada as much anymore. Yeah. Yeah. This is, it was just one of those words that was there and I didn't do the proper research. I'm sorry. No worries. We're talking about the art piece, right? So yeah. <laughs> you needed the art piece. <laughs> yes. <laughs> The one thing I found is, uh, ooh, cholera. I find this one really interesting, especially because of the um, uh, the earthquake in Haiti. And the, the people there didn't have cholera, which I, f I find so interesting. And then it was actually an aid worker who brought cholera to uh, Haiti, which is really sad. It's an intestinal bug that gives you diarrhea and then you, you get dehydrated and, mm -hmm. and you can actually die from it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's quite waterborne as well, which is. Yeah. You, you can see the little aphlagia that would swim through the water. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. Yeah, the little tail there that allows that, that bacteria to sort of be in the water. Um, and that's why we see it often in disaster zones. You said like Haiti is, is oftentimes the water uh, infrastructure is damaged after something like that earthquake. And so we can see that resurgence of a cholera. Yeah. Yeah. So that was sort of the trading. And then there's also the surviving pieces. And I think this one in particular touches on what we kind of said about how we're all a lot more aware of sort of our medical environment or our, or our virus or bacterial environment these days. Yeah, I was... Uh... Oh, oh, first of all, Surviving is a series that starts with the discovery of HIV, which was either 82 or 86. Do you? Uh, I don't have the number off the top of my head. <laughs> <laughs> I should remember this. I wanted to like divide the diseases into time periods and mm -hmm. um, Surviving is what we're into right now. And um, I during the pandemic, I was beating COVID, the, the big ones, and I was getting kind of uh, tired of it. And I was like, it's got to be another way to talk about COVID besides the, the flat disc. And um, I thought, I'll, I'll do it on masks. That mask is protecting us, and then the virus is uh, com trying to come into the mask. And so I did a series of eight of them, and this is one of them. Mm -hmm. it's, it's quite striking. I think masks have become part of our daily lives much more than they have for many of us been previous to the pandemic. So to see something like this that's become so, I think, representative in a way of the pandemic with this beadwork on it is beautiful. Yeah, I was, um, I was doing uh, beading circles at um, health sciences at the University of Saskatchewan. I was artist in residence. And so like um, nurses and doctors and students would come and they'd bead with me. And I remember I was asking uh, one of the nurses about masks and how in Japan, whenever they're sick, they put a mask on. And, and she said, oh, it's mostly a cultural thing. I, masks don't really protect you. And then this whole thing, and suddenly we're all wearing, you know, four layer masks, um, which I just found really interesting. And, and I think, I've been talking to uh, friends and people that I know about, like, if you had a cold, would you wear a mask? And they're saying, yes, yes, I would wear a mask if I was out with a cold, which I think is a good preventative measure. Yeah, I mean, it, it helps what we've been told many times from you know public health and, and all kinds of experts about how they help prevent our germs from getting on surfaces or getting in other people's uh, spaces. And so that really does help prevent or or minimize the spread of disease. So I think that's a really good 
kind of after effect of the pandemic is if we yeah. kind of are able to normalize mask wearing a little bit more for things beyond just COVID um, and it might help yeah. with the spread of disease. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, let's see what one we have next. I think actually HIV might be the next one here. So you mentioned yeah. that one. So there's the, the beadwork. Yes, HIV was, uh, the discovery of HIV is like uh, a new, it was like new, 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 um, and it hadn't been seen before. And unfortunately in Saskatchewan, we have the highest HIV rate um, of anywhere in Canada. And that's mostly through intravenous drug use. And so um, when I do an HIV, I'm especially um, uh, cognizant of the, what's happening in Saskatchewan, especially amongst uh, Indigenous people and HIV on reserve where they don't have um, prevention um, to help them. Mm -hmm. Or harm reduction, sorry. You can sort of see it in, in this image in particular, but I've seen you see it really when you're in person, the, the number of beads it takes to do an individual piece like this and the, the intricacy of it all. I have to wonder, how long does it take you to, to do one of these pieces? <laughs> well, now I can be um, comfortably for four, four hours a day, but um, it, it depends if I'm making tight circles or not, because uh, I have uh, tendonitis in this thumb. And so if I'm constantly turning it, then uh, I'll have to take the next day off. But if it's like doing the big circular ones, um, I can do those day after day. It just depends on the design. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But they take about uh, four hours a day, about two weeks. That's 40 hours. Yeah. Yeah, yeah a lot of work goes into these. Yes. <laughs> hepatitis C. Yes. And along with HIV comes hepatitis C. And yeah, <laughs> Saskatchewan is the highest uh, number of uh, hep C. Um, in Canada again. And again, it's related to uh, sharing of uh, needles. It's just, uh, that one's really easy to, to pass. But fortunately there is a, a, there is a cure for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And now I think the one, uh, Dr. Edmonton was one of the um, doctors who uh, found a cure for hepatitis C. Yeah, it's, it's one of the um, great things about science is we continue to move forward and, and research and come up with new uh, treatments or cures or ways to, to minimize the effects. So uh, we've got a whole bunch of comments coming in as well, Ruth, about uh, the beauty and the impact of your beadwork from viewers. Um, so just so you know, we're kind of putting some of those up on the screen, some of the appreciation and, and people are really looking forward to, to coming and seeing your pieces here in Kenora. Yeah, and uh, somebody, uh, Marie, Anne Marie wrote in diphtheria is bacteria spread from person to person, usually through respiratory droplets, like from coughing or sneezing. Mm -hmm. uh, and then HIV was first discovered in 1983. Yeah. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. Oh, I can't, you know, uh, this work is about the smallpox blankets, and this is a direct quote from Jeffrey Amherst. And it, it extricate and the extrapol one, one uh, you can't find the words in the dictionary, they're so old, nobody uses them. But it means, like, let's get rid of this uh undesirable race, and so that's uh, he was a British um general, and he uh. Indians were just in the way of the expansion of uh, North America. This was before uh, America became a country, so it's just like wide open space. Yeah, he he didn't like us very much. Yeah, and there's the pieces you mentioned there, the smallpox blankets there. Yeah, yeah. Um, I 
I had been like doing the the discs of smallpox, but I wanted to do it in kind of a more impactful way and look at how um, Jeffrey Amherst was talking about um, uh, genocide. And so I did some research and I, uh, he sent this letter out to different, um, I don't know much about military, but different men who oversaw forts on the, the what they called the frontier. And he said, okay, so here's my plan. We're going to, if you have a smallpox outbreak, collect the blankets and the handkerchiefs and uh, give them out to Indians and uh, let's just get rid of them that way. And so um, these two Indians came to, I, sh I should say indigenous people, came to a fort and there was a smallpox outbreak and they they wanted to warn them that in uh, different indigenous tribes were amassing and they were going to attack and so um the guy said the head of the fort said okay uh thank you for that information and here have some blankets and gave them two blankets and a handkerchief and so um in this installation, I, I went to um, uh, Army Youth Surplus Place uh, in Saskatoon, and I, I couldn't, well, obviously, it'd be too hard to get British blankets, but Canada ones, British, oh, they'll do. So I went in and I asked the man if he had any um, blankets, and he said, oh, no, no, those are, those are hard to find. And I said, oh, that's too bad because I'm doing a project. And he said, well, yeah, they're, they're really hard to find. So as I left the store, he says, oh, how many do you want? And so I was like, just had to pick a number out of my head. And so I said, 100. And he said, oh, oh, give me your phone number. I'll phone you next week. And within a week, he had gathered 100 blankets from across Canada and it was really interesting working because these blankets were actually used and I, I love to have that that um, material that's been used by people so some were torn uh, some of the wool ones had shrunk and then in about the 80s they start coming out with these blankets of unknown fiber which were <laughs> they were really interesting and so uh, those blankets are all through the ages of uh, the armed uh, forces in Canada. And um, on each one, you can see I beaded a small uh, smallpox. And then I wrapped them, I folded them, uh, wrapped them in a big red bow so they look like they're really, you know, wow, it's a present, yay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then the downside was that oh, smallpox, um, smallpox actually spread through uh, uh, the Americas before even white people reached them. It just it just went from camp to camp to camp to camp. It was, it was really a terrible, terrible thing. Yeah. And there's just another view of the blankets there stacked as well. Yeah. The next pieces that the muse has here is some from the boil water advisory series yes i did a larger piece which was don't breathe don't drink which looked at uh, housing and uh, the water situation on indigenous reserves this is a smaller piece uh but it's like the same um idea it's um it is supposed to represent a family on a reserve uh with a boil water advisory and so in the glasses, I've beaded um, in three dimensions uh, uh, seven of the basic um, bacterium that are found in uh, indigenous boil water advisories. And so uh, I have different uh, size glasses, and I, uh, these are secondhand. I went to secondhand stores and, and bought them. Because I, I, I want that look that they've been used, very well used by a family. And if you look on the right at the back, there's a baby bottle. Mm -hmm. um, I either uh, put in the, 
this smaller piece I put in a baby bottle or a sippy cup to remind people that it's babies, small children, children of all ages that are, are uh, consuming this water and getting sick. Mm -hmm. And um, it, um, when you see the piece that they're floating, well, they're not floating, they're encased in resin. And um, I have to say they look gorgeous. It took me um, three years, two years of thinking about how I wanted to do it. And then I talked to an artist friend, Cindy Baker, and she knows about resin. So we um, got together and worked for three years um, on this entire body of work. Mm -hmm. and we were successful in some and not in others. Sorry about those yeah. dogs. <laughs> it, it really does look like they're floating in water when yeah. you in the picture and even in person it it really does bring bring across that message of here are those those viruses and those bacteria that could be in the water um when they're not you know when we don't have the proper infrastructure there for those indigenous communities um, and just yeah. the fact that you've enlarged them it, i think it just drives home that message yeah yeah it was interesting watching people because uh, they'll they'll just kind of like look around and their little finger would go and they'll poke the top to see <laughs> to see if it's water or not. Yeah, that's that's how much it looks like water is. Yeah. Can, I, can I touch it? Can I just check? <laughs> mm -hmm. You mentioned that, that these pieces. Um, so here at the Muse, they have the the boil water pieces. You mentioned that the the boil water pieces are part of a wider uh, series that you did called Don't Breathe, Don't Drink. Right. Um, what's the other the other piece of that? So don't drink, I assume, is the boil water part. So what's the don't breathe part? Oh, okay. So at the AGO in Toronto, um, <clears throat> you'll go in and you'll see uh, one of those, you know, banquet tables. They're, they're, I think they're eight feet long, but they're 30 inches wide, they're very narrow. And it is covered with a blue plastic tarp and beaded on uh, the tarp in um, their, <clears throat> like, um, how do I describe it? It's like stalks with uh, black mold images. So it's little round black um, mold hanging off these and there's two, they're crossed over. So they look quite decorative. Mm -hmm. And um, there are eight of them around the entire uh, tablecloth. And then on top of it is a hundred and I think it's 128 glasses of different sizes, baby bottles, sippy cups. And it's, it represents the uh, boil water advisories. For, so one glass for each reserve. So you see all these glasses on a table mm -hmm. and the, um, Blue tarp uh, um, references that water scap when they had the, they were in the summer, they were trying to make houses out of tarps, plastic tarps, because their houses were, you couldn't live in them because of the black mold. And black mold um, is a respiratory, you breathe it in and then it, mm -hmm. it uh, does all this stuff to you. And what really, um, gets to me is like when I you would watch um, that Mike Holmes and he'd go into a house and you go like, oh, there's black mold and they, they uh, you know, tape it off and some guys of respirators and the whole thing would come in with gloves and they'd take the black mold pieces out and they'd put them in these bags that were like, you know, mm -hmm. danger, danger. And then you contrast that with people in uh, really, really cheap northern housing having to live with it. It's that nobody goes danger, danger. You know, we have to, you know, take everything out of this house and redo mm -hmm. it. It's like, oh, geez, too bad. And, you know. Yeah. So that's what I was talking about. Mm -hmm. I think your, your pieces bring that message of, of sort of that contrast between what you see um indigenous populations versus you know our, our more urbanized cities or or non-indigenous populations and, and the, the kind of dichotomy between the treatment that they get um, yeah it's a past thing it's a present thing and hopefully we can move towards that being a thing of the past but currently um it's still a reality and i think it's really 
important to be talking about that and looking at that, you know, in the context of your work and otherwise, especially with um, National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, for example, coming up next week. Yeah. So I think this is the, the last of the sections of, of pieces that are in your uh, exhibition here at the Muse is the MRI mental health pieces. Okay, this is from a show that was curated by Felicia Gay in uh, Saskatoon at the galleries at the University of Saskatchewan. Uh, this is an installation shot of the um, uh, brain scans that I did, I wanted to talk about mental health. And um, I was trying to figure out a, a visual way to talk about mental health. And I, you know, kept coming up with ideas and I throw them away. And, and then finally, I started looking at brain scans and discovered all these images of brain scans that are in different um, mental health um, uh, episodes. And uh, I knew I, I uh, because they're brain scan and they're like, you know, put on a light table and, and uh, light is put through them. What I wanted to do was do it with beads that glowed in the dark, especially under a black light. Mm -hmm. And I had to wait, <laughs> I had to wait for them to invent them. Mm -hmm. And uh, so finally they're invented. I'm like, yes, yes, I'm buying these. And um, so I started uh, beating these brain scans and I actually have one here. So um, this one is uh, schizophrenia. Here, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, solo you so that they, everybody can see oh. you really well here. I can, yeah. There we go. We can see it a little bit more now on the screen. Yeah. So it is whoop, uh, not under black light. That is just how they look like. Mm -hmm. And the ones that you see on the PowerPoint are um, under black light. And so the, the colors become bolder and they sort of glow. And uh, oh, they look so beautiful. So these are framed, but they decided that instead of putting them on the walls, they wanted to put them on this table. So they're more like a specimen. Mm -hmm. And I think it worked really well. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. Yeah. We actually have a, a question for you from an audience member. So Ryan asks, how has the work been resonating with Indigenous audience in the face of a heightened awareness about truth and reconciliation? and intergenerational trauma among non-Indigenous Canadians. What do you want non-Indigenous Canadians to take away from your work? Uh, I think uh, I want uh, non-Indigenous Canadians to uh, recognize that we, uh, well, first of all, there's barriers to health. I think we've seen that in Quebec where there's, um, you know, racism within the health system that is, systemic oh. <laughs> and um we yeah we have barriers to health like people people uh who work within health systems some of them think of us as uh the authors of our own misfortune and and our misfortune is poverty um um improper especially if you live up north not being able to get the proper foods at a reasonable price like fresh fruit and vegetables um, and uh, unsafe drinking water is another thing that plays on our health. And then our mental health um, is uh, is something. Well, it's it's got a stigma in both communities that it's um, it's not real. It's something you can get over. And I wanted to present um, the brain scans as a visual thing of what's happening in somebody's brain. Mm -hmm. And for everybody to recognize that this person is, this person needs help and that we don't just look away, but that uh, uh, the state of mental health services in Canada is, well, it's appalling. I think we all know that. And um, with the pandemic, it just brought like so many children are having, you know, um, mental health problems like the, we need to live holistically to you know 
um, keep on top of our mental health and being isolated and away from your friends is really hard on children. Um, and so I want uh, every, everybody in the world to recognize uh, uh, mental health and how important it is to have good mental health. And those that don't, they need services. My daughter's bipolar and she had one manic episode and was hospitalized. And then a few years later, of course, this, this is so common among young people. She went off her medication and she had a second one. And she, but we, we were lucky. She was in Saskatoon at the time and she got a mental health nurse. She had a psychiatrist. Uh, she had family to support her. And I think what really made the difference the second time was the mental health nurse. She got to see the mental health nurse every week and they talked about a variety of things. And I think that made the most, um, that was the most helpful. And she, it's been 16 years. She's a filmmaker. She lives in Toronto. Um, she's very successful. And uh, it, it, it's possible to get over or to manage a mental illness. And live as a successful person. I often think people think that it's like, well, that's it. They're crazy. They're going to be crazy for the rest of their life, but you can manage it and you can move forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to remember which is, is this OCD? Anxiety. Anxiety. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, I meet so many young people, like 13, 14 years old that have anxiety and uh, it, it, it cripples them, you know, and I, I wonder about it. And I wonder why is that happening to someone so young? Because mm -hmm. I don't know, as a child, well, we had very different lives than they live now. We were running around outside, riding bikes, you know, climbing trees, all that bucolic stuff. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and, and, and I, like I was a, a shy child, which now there's, I, I had a bit of anxiety, but, you know, it, it didn't cripple me. Just made mm -hmm. me embarrassed every once in a while, but that was about it. Yeah. yeah. You wouldn't know it now, chatting with me here on, on <laughs> no. You're good to go. Ah, <laughs> uh, depression. Yeah, you can tell. It's so dark and one color and yeah, the brain's not happy or sad. It's just blah. Was the, the color choice on this one, I mean, sometimes we think about, we talk about, um, you know, you, you've got the blues when you're sad or down. So there's, there's quite a bit of blue in this one. Was that a, a color choice from you in terms of an artistic choice? Or was this like a representation, kind of those colors are what you saw when you were looking up the scans? Uh, yeah, it was the colors that I saw. Yeah. the And yeah, you're right. It got the blues. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. terrible. Yeah. And so many areas of the, the brain are dark. They're just not uh, engaged. And that that's kind of, um, w when they talk about depression and a heaviness, you know, that they feel a heaviness like they can't do anything. And then you look at this brain scan and it's like, yeah, your brain is just like heavy and sluggish and yeah. Yeah, I mean, because for maybe some viewers who, who aren't as familiar with brain scans, the, the, the areas of the brain that are lit up in a, in a sense on the screen are indicating areas of the brain that are metabolically active. So they're using oxygen, they're doing things. And so the, the fewer areas that are lit up, that, that indicates those areas of the brain really aren't, aren't, aren't active, aren't doing, doing things at the moment. So, um, yeah, you can see that in this one. Yeah. This one is PTSD. Yeah, I was just wondering if that's what it was. Yeah, um, it's uh, <clears throat> they uh, <clears throat> people say. Well, people experts 
say that indigenous people, we all suffer from PTSD. And uh, that does not surprise me. Um, from growing up as a child into an adult, into a mother, and now into, uh, uh, I don't know what to call myself. Uh, it's like you live, uh, you live with racism and, and, you know, you live with it on a daily basis and, and all the, the stuff that happens. And yeah, I could see why we would have PTSD, especially uh, like uh, residential school survivors. I imagine they have a lot of PTSD. Um, and so you can see where the brain, uh, it's a, now that I look at it, it's a very pretty design where the brain is uh, not really doing much. And then all you can see all the around the edge where it's all, uh, you know, bright green and pink and uh, yellow and, and how uh, overly um, stimulated parts of the brain are. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe the the PTSD you were saying, you know, the residential school survivors, it also comes back to that aspect of, of intergenerational trauma. Um, yeah. That it doesn't just end with the person who experienced the traumatic experience. It it can carry on. Yeah. Yeah. There was there was a break um in how to parent too when the children were taken away. And then, so you have like four to I think about 16 when you can leave school. You have all those years where you haven't parented that person. And so when they, those people grow up and become parents, they don't know how to parent because they didn't, they weren't modeled by their parents, right? They were modeled by um, strangers. And so you have that, um, distance and a lot of um, discipline, um, you know, uh, violence, spanking, hitting, that kind of thing, that that's, that's how they learn to parent. And then it just carries on through the generations. And I, I, I think there needs to be a lot of money put into um, housing, parenting, and uh, to help the, the generations move forward in a, in a healthy way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This one's mania. Yeah, yeah. I can see. Yeah. yeah the, the whole brain's just lit up. It's, it's not, everything is just working. I was talking to my daughter uh, about when she had her manic sh episode, and she said it's just like you're, it's like your brain is on fire. You know everything. You see everything. You think about everything. You discover everything. You know everything. It's just like everything is going off on your brain all at once. And, mm -hmm. and uh, your brain doesn't decide what's real or what's not or whatever. And uh, so I think this is a good representation of what it's like when you're in that state. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting to see as well. I mean, to hear that sort of firsthand account, and then you really you can see that translates into what we would, you know, almost expect when we're looking at that that brain scan scientifically. That description from your daughter of of what it's like to be in that state is is borne out in in the image here. We see that that brain is lit up. Oh yeah. <laughs> And, and when that image is under black light, it's it's spectacular, really spectacular. I think there might be one more. This one is OCD. Oh, OCD. It's uh, this one I find interesting because like the the frontal lobe is like it's like um, it's like a, a line straight across, and the frontal lobe is all. Mm -hmm busy doing stuff and then towards the back there's there's uh, a little bit of quiet but it's mostly quite active i um oh i've met some people have ocd and it's it's uh it can be like a uh organizational anxiety because they want everything to be in a certain way 
And if it's not, then they, they, they get anxious about it and they want to fix it. Like uh, I knew a young woman who was um, working with her psychiatrist on OCD and she was trying to leave her shoes in the front hall just kind of every which way and not line them all up. And so she had them every which way and her mother came over and her mother also suffered from OCD and she's like, mom, you have to leave my shoes alone. Don't touch them. And the mother's like, okay. And then <laughs> the woman goes to get something, comes back. Her mother has put all the shoes in a line. And it, it, so it's like this constantly wanting to organize something to the way that you want it. Yeah. The, the, you know, sort of ordered and in a line, I sort of looking at the, the beadwork here, I sort of see almost a parallel of these beads are in these beautiful lines in the piece that you've done here. Yeah. Yeah. Everything's ordered. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think that may be, there we go. Yeah. So that's the last of the, the images that we have here. So we'll pull the slideshow down and bring it back to just you and I. So I will remind our viewers that if you have any questions that we haven't already chatted about with Ruth that you wanted us to bring up, go ahead and toss them in the comments and we can chat about those. We did have one um, from Helena um, asking when we were talking about the don't breathe piece of the exhibit. So have you ever looked at um, blasto or blastomycosis, um, which is an airborne spore in the soil. Uh, and she said both humans and animals can get it in, in Kenora. I have never heard of it. Huh. But is it is it like only specific to Kenora? Or is it all over? Uh, it's not just Kenora. Um, it's, you know, there are more than one place that it's, uh, but it's not spread all the way across uh, Canada for sure. Um, but it's, a soil-based fungi. So in, instead of a virus or a bacteria, which is what many of the things you've looked at, um, it's actually a fungi and it produces uh, respiratory systems, fever and fatigue in both animals and humans. Huh. Is it, uh, do you just naturally get over it or? Um, I'm not sure on the treatment on that one actually. Ah, okay. Uh, and cause that makes me think of polio. I remember we talked a little bit about polio and, and, um, how uh, they're trying to eradicate polio, but polio uh, can be found, found in the soil. And uh, so I did take a look into polio for you after we chatted about it. Polio actually is spread through contact with an infected person. So it's not actually a soil based um, disease, it's oh. spread through contact with an infected person. And you're right, they are, it is one of the things that we're trying to eliminate and eradicate. Um, but there's an important difference between elimination and eradication. So polio has been eliminated in our area, um, mm -hmm. in Canada, which means that there are no active or new cases happening within Canada, um, but it's not eradicated yet. So eradicated means that across the world, there's no new cases and it's you know, gone, and we don't need any protective measures uh, against it anymore. So when the disease is eliminated, we still need things like vaccine uh, programs or other protective programs. When it's eradicated, it's gone, and it's not, you know, over somewhere else that might be transferred around. Um, and so then we actually have eradicated it and gotten rid of it completely. So, so that's like uh, the eradication of smallpox. Yep, and uh, it it's gone. Mm -hmm. okay. It'll never come back. Is there any other diseases that have been eradicated? Only one. So oh. two diseases have been officially declared eradicated. Smallpox is one of them. And then there's another one called rinderpest that's been eradicated. But eradication is really difficult because there's a lot of factors that go into being able to have had that happen. Um, you have mm -hmm. to think about how the disease is spread. So depending on how it's spread, it can be easier, more, more easy or more difficult to, to be able to eradicate something. There's also socioeconomic factors in terms of, um, you know, one area of the world may have the resources to vaccinate all their people and then be good to go. But another area, if we don't get them vaccines and help them to vaccinate their population, then it's going to continue to percolate or, or um, continue to spread over there. 
Uh, and then sometimes what can happen is if one part of the world has been fully vaccinated, they have eliminated in their area and they may ease up on their control measures, maybe ease up on their vaccination. Um, and then that opens up that population once again to risk of if someone from the area where it is circulating comes and visits, that that could um, open up that population. So eradication is much more difficult to achieve than elimination. It's absolutely a goal that we would love to get to, um, but it is much more difficult. Yeah, it's it, w when we think of the pandemic and COVID-19, um, uh, we think of place, uh, places like Colombia and India where they're heavily populated, very little vaccination is going on and variants are coming out. Um, I, I think um, um, G7 countries think that because we're better off financially and through healthcare and that kind of stuff that we can, um, we can sort of uh, get rid of COVID through vaccination, but we live globally. And, and so we have to start, you know, sending um, vaccines to the world where we can get um, more people vaccinated. Because I, I worry about new variants um, because or mutations that can overrun us again. So, yeah. Yeah, and that's absolutely something that um, I've talked about quite a lot, right, is, is that need to, to vaccinate more than just the local population um, so that we can control the COVID-19 yeah. pandemic on a wider scale so that then, you know, that has benefits for everyone. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. But that, that aspect of globalization, I think, um, ties back to what you brought with your trading and surviving series is that that those diseases came over yeah. because of that that kind of start of globalization in a sense yeah true mm -hmm. i see we've got a bunch more comments here of people saying that the the works are incredible um they're looking forward to seeing them in person um and we also did have someone uh remind or let us know so we were talking about blastomycosis and, and what kind of treatment you need and it, it is a medication that you would treat uh, canines and humans with um, and it would be an antifungal medication and it can take six months to a year to fully recover from wow wow mm -hmm. yeah. so ruth i want to thank you so much for joining us today for this chat it's been lovely chatting and, and, and getting to know your art with you. Um, thank you so much for joining us. I would encourage everyone to come out and see this exhibition here in Kenora. It's beautiful uh, and has a really important message, I think. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. And yeah, go see them in person because they're gorgeous. Terrible, but gorgeous. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think that's that's really a good way to sum it up. Terrible, but gorgeous. Yeah. Thanks so much, Ruth. Okay. Bye. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us for our chat here with Ruth Cuthand, whose exhibit is at the Muse until November 27th. Like I said, this is part of the Kenora Science Festival taking place right now in Kenora. Uh, we have more events through the rest of the week. So if you want to see the full description of events, go ahead and check out sciencenorth.ca forward slash Kenora SciFest. Thanks so much for joining us. <laughs>